someone were to ask you what kind of example that you are, what would you say? Now, we must remember that everyone is an example of something, right? The question is, of what? What are we an example of? Does our life and our actions uh, represent uh, that which is humble and selfless? Um, or does our actions of life represent someone who is controlling, arrogant, prideful? What, what, what do we look like? What kind of example are we being to the world around us? Well, today our title of our message is Examples of Spiritual Servants. We're going to be looking at two spiritual servants today that are examples to us and learning from their lives. But before we do that, just have a little recap of what we touched on last week because we're going through the book of Philippians here on a journey through the book, wonderful book. The main theme is joy. But last week in the book of Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, the Apostle Paul exhorted us to work out our salvation with the right attitude. Remember that? We talked about attitudes last week. And he was talking to the, uh, the complainers and disputers there in the Philippian congregation and then also to those beyond them. Well, first of all, he commanded them to stop complaining and disputing. It was a commandment from God. And then he gave them three reasons for obeying that command. He said, first of all, it's for our own sakes, and then for the sake of others, or the unsaved, and then for the sake of spiritual leaders uh, who teach and preach the Word of God. Well, what, did we, what else did we learn about that? Well, we learned that complaining and disputing is what? It is sin, it hurts God, it hurts ourselves, it hurts others, and it can make us physically sick. And we learned that we can overcome a complaining, complaining attitude by doing what? First of all, repenting of our sin, recognizing it as sin, and repenting of it, and then uh, we need to what? Replace it with an attitude of gratitude and praise to God. And that's what God wants us to do. Now, today, as we continue in the book of Philippians here, uh, chapter 2, verses 17 through 30, the apostle presents three men whose lives are exceptional patterns for spiritual servants or godly living. These three, Paul, Timothy, and Epaphroditus, were together in Rome at this time. Paul was a prisoner in his own rented quarters at this time when he wrote this letter. Though chained to a soldier, he was free to carry on his work unhindered. Timothy, he was the apostle's son of the faith and had been with him for some time. Epaphroditus had been sent from the Philippian church to bring financial support for Paul and to minister to his needs. Each of these men were passionately devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ, not consumed with their own interests. For the Lord's sake, each had risked his health, his freedom, and even his life to help others and to please the Lord. Well, today, we're only going to look at the first two. We don't have enough time to look all the way to all three of them. Uh, Lord willing, we'll, next week we'll be looking at Epaphroditus as an example of a spiritual servant. Today we're going to be looking at the Apostle Paul and Timothy. And so first of all, we're going to be talking about the, the Apostle Paul and looking at his life. Look at verse 17. He says, Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Well, you see, the Apostle uses a very beautiful illustration here to describe the service of the Philippians and of himself. Both Jews and Gentiles would have understood uh, the implied imagery of the drink offering as something new to us or different to us. Uh, or they might also look at it as a, they call it a libation. A, it was a ritual that was familiar to many ancient people. After placing the sacrificial animal on the altar, and thank goodness we don't do that anymore. <laughs> Aren't you glad we don't have to do that? I mean, can you imagine that? I, I can't imagine that. You know. uh, I remember you know, going hunting with my dad as a teenager and, and um, 
getting killing squirrels and rabbits and you know in different ways and then uh, the worst part is skinning them thing. Oh, I hated that part of that when he had to skin them. The smell and the stench, and I'm thinking, can you imagine in the Old Testament where they did thousands and thousands of them? I mean, one right after another of these bulls and goats and sheep. Thank you, Lord, I'm living now. <laughs> but anyway, the, the Paul's audience, you know, at this time, they knew what he was talking about when he said a drink offering. The priest would take wine or uh, sometimes water or honey and pour it either on the burnt offering or on the ground in front of the altar. That act symbolized the rising of the sacrifice into the nostrils of the deity to whom it was being offered. And so Paul's drink offering was also made on behalf of his beloved brethren in Philippi. He loved them so much and offering made upon the sacrifice and service of their faith. The Philippians were partners with Paul in sacrificial service to God, especially through the ministry of Epaphroditus. They were suffering severely for their faith in an extremely hostile pagan environment. It seems as though that the more the church grew in Christ's likeness, the more it was resented and persecuted. Kind of sounds like today, doesn't it? If you, and the Bible, doesn't the Bible tell us that if, if anyone desires to live godly, he will be what? Persecuted. We will be persecuted. And the closer we live to him, the more we see that we will be persecuted. The Apostle Paul compares the self-sacrifice and suffering of the Philippians with his own, magnifying theirs and minimizing his. They were both laying down their lives for the sake of the gospel. But their action he regards as the, being the sacrifice, or great sacrifice of faith, and his as only the drink offering poured out upon it, or beside it. Here the apostle reflects the sincere humility that marks the spiritual noble believer, and that was supremely exemplified by the Lord himself in his incarnation. So are we, are we humble? Uh, if someone were to look at you and watch your life uh, for a while, would they say that you are humble? Well, you know, that's a hard one, isn't it? Because if you're a humble person, you're selfless. You don't think of yourself. You're always looking out for the welfare. You're always doing things to bless and help others. And that's the way Paul was. He, he never thought about himself. He was always thinking about what he could do to glorify God and help other people, and especially share the gospel with others so they can be saved. Therefore, he writes, I am glad and rejoice with you all. The apostle has already mentioned several reasons for his joy. He rejoiced because of his love for them and their love for him. He was very close to this congregation. Uh, and simply remembering his uh, beloved congregation at Philippi brought him great joy. Paul also rejoiced knowing that the gospel was being spread through his imprisonment. Yeah, he was imprisoned, but yet, God used that for the furtherance of the gospel. Isn't that amazing? We can find ourselves in terrible circumstances sometimes, but if we trust God in that, God can actually use that circumstance to further his glory and the gospel. And even when the gospel was preached with pretense and out of selfish ambition and envy by some of those false apostles, Paul rejoiced even then because the gospel was going out. He loved the Lord and he wanted the gospel to go forth. We need to re be reminded that sacrificial service to the Lord is in itself a privilege and a cause for rejoicing. Unfortunately, many believers today experience joy in much the same way the world does. What are you talking about? Well, the world, they enjoy peace and happiness and have joy when circumstances are favorable. That's when they're happy. But when circumstances are unfavorable, they are sad and sometimes resentful. The only thing that brings them joy are those that promote their own interests and welfare. But when spiritually mature believers seek to do the Father's will and please Him, they view sacrifice for Him with joy. We have to work on that, don't we? We don't always do that. But that's what we 
should do, and we're learning that from the Apostle Paul here, that as God causes us to sacrifice our lives, in other words, give up those things that I want to do for me, to please me in this life, so that I can have what? More time, energy, and talent, and finance, and whatever, to do what? Please God, bring glory to Him, and reach the lost. Are we willing to sacrifice? And, and stop, isn't it? Because we get it caught up in our little worlds, and we want to be comfortable in a sense. We want to have things. And a certain amount that God understands, He knows we have to provide for our family and for ourselves. But also, He looks at our, heart, our hearts, and He sees what we're really after. What are we after? What's our passion? What are we really living for? Are we living for to be comfortable? Are we living for to have the biggest house or the best car or the or, or whatever? Are, are we living for that greatest vacation? What are we living for? What is our passion? What is driving us? Well, it should be God and our love for Him should be driving us. Right? And don't we see, that's what we see in the Apostle Paul. The reason many believers knew little about Paul's kind of joy is that they knew, knew very little about his kind of sacrifice, right? He sacrificed so much. It was amazing. You see, our greatest joy comes at the point of greatest sacrifice. Because serving God is the supreme purpose of our existence. Let me say that again. Serving God is the supreme purpose of our existence. Amen? It really is. Serving Him. And we should ask ourselves, we should evaluate ourselves each day, each week, Am I bringing glory to God today? Is my life making a difference? Am I, when people watch me, are they, do they see Jesus? Am I proclaiming Him? Am I proclaiming the gospel? You know, we really need to ask ourselves those questions. Because Paul and the Philippians had sacrificed and served together, they were able to rejoice together. Therefore, Paul admonishes them in verse 18, saying, For the same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me. So he was saying how that he loved being with them, but he also loved their attitude and their heart and how that they wanted to please God and to honor him above all things. Well, the second example of a spiritual Christ-like servant is Timothy, Paul's beloved son in the faith. Like Paul, his mentor and model, Timothy is a trustworthy example for other believers to emulate. Paul was hoping to send Timothy to Philippi to find out how they were doing. Paul says in verse 19, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. Well, because his imprisonment prevented Paul, excuse me, from going to Philippi personally, it was his hope in the Lord Jesus, that is to say, in the Lord's will, to send Timothy there shortly, so that he also might be encouraged when he learned of the Philippian state or condition. Just like I'm sure of you have, you know, you have loved ones, maybe siblings that you don't hear from uh, very often. You know, like just recently, I was able to spend time with my siblings, who I don't get to see very often. Uh, because of our granddaughter Sarah's wedding, I uh, arranged, I asked them all, I said, hey, the next day, uh, I said, can we all get together for lunch? Um, so I have two other brothers and a sister, my sister, who married Patty's brother, Bart, live out in San Diego, California. Now, my other two brothers live over in Ohio, in the area where we grew up in, around uh, a Mansfield area in Ashland and that area over there. But I, I still don't get to see them very often. Usually uh, uh, Christmas time um, and funerals. That's about it. And this time wedding. You know, we, and so God worked it out. And so there's that desire. Don't you have that desire? You, you, want to, you, you miss that. And same way here, uh, Paul, uh, he, he, he loved these folks here. He missed being with them. The apostle's hope was not an idle wish, but the deep longing of his heart. Why? Because he never wanted to act independently of his master's will. His hope and expectation was in line with the purpose of the Lord Jesus. Paul, no doubt, prayed earnestly for the Lord's direction and was determined to adjust and 
discard his own plans if necessary. But we have a desire. We seek God's will, and when that God's working out, right? That's what we should do. That's what Paul was doing here. Paul was very much concerned for the Philippian saints, but he expected to be encouraged as he received a positive report from Timothy about them. Among Paul's companions, Timothy was unique in his unselfish care for the spiritual condition of the Philippians. When you think about Timothy, where was he from? What was he like? Well, Timothy was a native of Lystra in the province of Galatia, which is what we know as a, a part of a modern Turkey, the country of Turkey today. His mother, Eunice, was Jewish, and his father was a Greek and probably a pagan. Paul led Timothy to Christ probably during his visit to Lystra on his first missionary journey. <laughs> so he was a son in the faith to the apostle. Both his mother and his grandmother Lois uh, were uh, believers and had instructed Timothy in the Old Testament that he was not circumcised as a child suggests that his father had educated him in Greek learning and culture. Along with his spiritual maturity, his combined Jewish and Greek heritage made him uniquely qualified to minister the gospel with Paul to the Gentile world. By the time Paul wrote this letter of Philippians, Timothy had been his almost constant companion for about 10 years already. And so they were drawing really close to one another, really getting to know each other, and Timothy uh, was like Paul's right-hand man. Timothy was faithful and dependable in every way and clearly was qualified to be a model to the Philippians to emulate. There were well, they were well acquainted with him since he doubtless was with Paul when the church was founded, uh, according to Acts 16.3. It is... Therefore, hardly surprised that the apostle was eager uh, to send Timothy to them as quick as he could. Because he knew they were close, they knew each other, and he could find out how the congregation was doing. Well, because Paul wanted the Philippians to act to accept Timothy without hesitation, he gave them a brief profile of the of that dedicated servant of Jesus Christ in verses 20 to 23. The apostle highlighted six personal characteristics for the Philippians to emulate. He said Timothy was, first of all, like-minded, then he was sympathetic, next Christ-minded, then seasoned, submissive, and last available. Well, let's look at how he was like-minded to start with. Verse 20. Paul says, For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. Well, first, Paul shares that Timothy is like-minded. What's that mean? Well, he says that in the first part of verse 20, for I have no one like-minded. Timothy's spiritual character was similar to that of the apostles. In many ways, Timothy was a sure or true kindred spirit with Paul. Right off the bat, the apostle makes the point that he had no one else of Timothy's stature. He had been instructed in the scriptures from childhood by his mother and grandmother and was highly regarded by those who knew him. Yet Timothy's greatest spiritual growth began when he did what? When he began to travel and minister with the Apostle Paul. That's when he really began to grow in his walk with the Lord. Timothy had the unique and inviolable privilege of being the Apostle's protege. Wouldn't that be amazing? Can you imagine that? To being right beside the Apostle Paul? Only thing is, I, I was going to suffer like he did. <laughs> oh my goodness. Apostle Paul suffered. I mean, God used him greater than anyone I can think of uh, and in so many ways. I mean, he wrote, what, 13 books in the New Testament and all that he went through. Oh my goodness. Well, you know, when you look at through the Bible, those who God used to bring glory to him the most Seemed to go through a lot, didn't they? They had to go through a lot. But God used them in amazing ways. That Greek word for like-minded is used only here in the New Testament and is a compound word that means equal-souled or one-souled. 
referring to people who are activated by the same motives or of like character. They have a kindred spirit. Timothy's spiritual character was similar to that of the Apostle Paul. Second, Timothy also had the virtue of being sympathetic. With the utmost confidence, Paul could assure the, Tim the Philippians that Timothy, he says, will sincerely care for their state. The words care for expresses a strong feeling for something or someone, often to the point of being burdened or anxious. Timothy had that heart that he cared for people. And it showed in his actions toward them. Paul uses the word here in a positive sense to describe Timothy's great concern for the welfare of the Philippian church. And so do you, do you, do you sense that, that deep down burden to help other people? To encourage them? To come alongside them? To help them? And most of all, to help them find Jesus. You know, what, what God wants us to do a lot of times, He wants us to come along people that we don't know and befriend them so that they will feel comfortable with us, trust us, and then we can do what? Share Him with them. So we should be thinking about, as Christians, we, would think, we should be thinking about all the time, Lord, bring someone across my path. Maybe it's a co-worker, maybe it's my neighbor, maybe uh, it's a relative, maybe it's someone down the street. Uh, Lord, Bring them across my path. Bring us together. Allow us to spend time together to where that we can get to know one another. And Lord, give me the words. Make an opportunity that I can share Jesus with them. Do we do that? Do we even think about that? See, that's a life that's sacrificing, that giving to God. So, Lord, help us. Because I know how all of us are. Because I'm that way too. That we, we get caught in, in our daily lives. And I like structure. How about you? I just like it. I like structure. I'm going to do this now, I'm this, and that. I like, I like to know I accomplish this, and accomplish that, and accomplish that. That's just who I am. You know, I do the same thing all the time, and I'm happy doing it. And Patty, she's just, she just ah, you know. She looks at me, she likes different things and different times. I just love structure, you know. And, uh, and so, you know, are we, willing, are we willing to sacrifice? Are we willing to look beyond our little worlds? And reach out to people around us. Look at, look at, look at your, take time to look at your life and time and see what you're consumed with. Sometimes I'm consumed very much with me. What's going to make me feel good? What's going to make me happy? You know, God wants us to be consumed with Him most of all, amen? And then consumed with how can I reach other people? Now, we're all, we're all in different fields. We're all in different areas. We've got to use this in different ways, right? We all have our different opportunities. But we should be thinking about that. Being like Timothy here. He was like-minded. He was sympathetic. And now we see here in the third virtue that he was the Christ-mindedness. And, and, and so, look what it says in verse 21. Paul says, for all seek their own, not the things which are of, Je of Christ Jesus. So Paul laments the self-centered, loveless attitude of those leaders, although the gospel was being proclaimed by a number of men, excuse me, in Rome, it was sometimes preached out of envy and strife and selfish ambition rather than from pure motives. It's like you've got the televangelists now that a lot of them, all they care about is the money, you know, they just want to grow their, their kingdom, you know. Well, you know, if they preach the gospel, which I hope they do, some of them don't, but uh, I praise God. I praise God when they mention the name of Jesus, right? And how to be truly saved. And to do that, I praise God. That's what Paul was doing. Even though he didn't agree with a lot of their other ways and things they were doing, he was praising God. They were preaching about Jesus. Paul nevertheless rejoiced that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ was being proclaimed. Do we care about that? Do we even... Think about the idea that Christ is being proclaimed. When you go to Walmart, when you go to this store, do you think about those people beside you? Do you think about their soul? Do you think about whether they're saved or they're lost or they're headed to a devil's hell? We should. We should really think about people more so than what we're going to the store for. 
I know it's important sometimes. I have to write it down or I forget. <laughs> yeah, I forget what I'm going for. Yeah, absent minded. Um, but we're, we're children of the King. We're ambassadors for Christ. We're different. We're supposed to be unique. And we should be on a mission for our King. Amen? We should be. But I know it, it, it's God understands, you know, how we are so earthly minded. We get so connected to things that are earthly when He wants us to be eternal, spiritually minded. So, what do we do? In order to do that, we really have to seek Him more. Seek Him more in reading the His Word and seek Him more in the intimate prayer. And as we do that, He'll help us to remind us to reach out to those around us and be like the Apostle Paul and as Timothy here. This, does this have a message for us today in our, our little worlds where we get caught up in everything we accept the kingdom of God? Like Paul, Timothy's dominant interest uh, when Paul wrote this letter was still the things of Christ Jesus. And that was foremost in his mind. Fourth, a fourth characteristic of Timothy is that he was seasoned. What does that mean? Well, look what Paul says in verse 22. But you know his proven character. Talking okay, about Timothy's proven character. Paul did not have to convince the church at Philippi of that because they knew firsthand of Timothy's proven character. He had been with them for years and had worked with them, been around them. The word's proven character has the basic meaning of proof after testing. Used of a person... It described proven character or tested value. Paul used the verb form numerous times in his admonitions for believers to prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect, according to Romans 12.2, and to examine themselves, like 1 Corinthians 11.28. Timothy had been tested many times in his service to the Lord. The church at Philippi was well acquainted with Timothy and had benefited from his faithful service for many, many years. Have you been tested? Have you been through some trials? How did you come out on those trials? See, we, we don't want to be like a dog chasing his tail. You ever see that? And they're getting nowhere. You know, we don't want to be like that. Uh, have I done that? Yes, I've done that. Yeah, there's times that God put me through a, a test and I fail miserably, you know. That's why I do it again, you know. And so we don't want to be like that. We want to, you know, have that faith, success, spiritual success where we, we say, yes, Lord, this is about you, not about me, or whatever you want me to do. Here I am, Lord. As Isaiah said, Isaiah said Lord, here I am, send me. We should be that way. And so here Timothy had that proven character. And then fifth, we learned that he was submissive. Okay, let's look at that. Paul, like Paul, Timothy was submissive to the Lord, first of all. In the last part of verse 22, Paul says, that as a son with his father, he served me in the gospel. The word serve was used of many types of service. As the next phrase in the gospel makes clear, serve here refers to serving the Lord, first of all. Timothy was completely submissive to Paul as an apostle, a spiritual father, and an incomparable model of godliness. But Paul makes it clear that this particular service was not to him, but with him in the gospel. They served the Lord together in a loving and non-competitive partnership in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul was clearly the senior, and Timothy the respected junior. Yet the two men were both bond servants of Jesus Christ, willing to uh, put themselves out there, sacrifice themselves, and share the good news of Jesus Christ. Last, we have the uh, virtue of uh, Timothy of being available. He was available. Paul says in verse 33, he said, Therefore I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. Because Timothy had thus proved himself... Paul hoped to send him to the Philippians as soon as he learned the outcome of his appeal to Caesar. The context makes it clear that Timothy was willing to do whatever Paul asked him to do. 
He had no agenda of his own. For him, being available to the Lord, and essentially meant being a servable or available uh, to the Apostle Paul. Lord, here I am. Whatever you want me, I'll, I'll to do that. That's the way we should be. Whatever it is, Lord, here it is. Here I am. Send me. But, Timothy wasn't perfect. You know any perfect people? No, I don't know any either. You know? But Timothy had human frailties. Despite his divine calling and spiritual gifts, he apparently lacked self-confidence because of his youthfulness. Also, he was tempted by youthful passions, as we see in 2 Timothy 2, verses 21 and 22, that the Apostle Paul talks about. Apparently, Timothy was then at a low point in his personal life and ministry. He had victories and defeats. He had experienced satisfaction and disappointment. He had happinesses and sadness. But he heeded Paul's counsel no matter what. Paul said this to him, Continue in the things that you have learned and become convinced of, knowing that from whom you have learned them. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. And Paul goes to continue. He said, Be sober and in all things endure hardship. Do the work of the evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And Timothy says, Here I am. Sign me up. Are we willing to say that? Paul ends in verse 24 saying, but I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. Paul was putting his trust in the Lord that he might be set free so he might what? Visit the Philippians once again, have wonderful fellowship with them, and possibly even be a blessing to them. But they were a blessing to him. Paul and Timothy were two different individuals. Paul was the bold, fearless leader. Timothy he was quiet, a devoted assistant. Yet they manifested the most important characteristic of all. They had a Christ-like servant attitude. A life worth imitating. The apostle highlighted six personal characteristics of Timothy for us to look at and to think about if we line up like this. He was like-minded. He was sympathetic. He was Christ-minded. He was seasoned. He was submissive, submissive, and he was available. These are in your outline there. You can see and explaining a little bit about them in that outline in your bulletins. In Luke 9, 23 and 24, Jesus said, If anyone desires to come, up to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever will lose his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. How much of your life are you willing to give up for the kingdom of God? What kind of example are you to others? Are you willing to pour out your life for God and other people so they can have eternal life? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your precious word. Thank you for the examples of the Apostle Paul. We just scratched, scratched the church surface with him, Father, but nevertheless, Lord, we see his example here in this passage, and also with Timothy, uh, a beloved son in the faith for Paul. Father, I pray that you would help us, that we could emulate them, as Paul says, as I follow Christ, follow me. And so I pray that you help us, Lord, to do the same. Lord, help us to take a good look at our lives. Uh, are, we, it, it, are our lives simply about us and what makes us happy and satisfied? Or, Lord, or is it about bringing glory to you and helping others? Lord, just wake us up spiritually. Get in our attention. Challenge us. Change us. Lord, to be more like your son. Bring people across our path, Lord, even today, that we might share the good news of Jesus with you. Thank you, Father, for Praise you. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right, let's uh, get our last song here.